The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Our mission here on earth as Christians has sometimes been simplified down to two things. Just two things we're supposed to do. We love God and we love our neighbors. Just these two things. Jesus at one point is asked in scripture what we're supposed to do to have life. He says, what do you think? Someone suggests maybe love God and our neighbor. And Jesus says, you have spoken correctly. Do this and you will live. Loving God and loving our neighbors is the good life that God wants for us. This morning, we're going to try to gain some clarity on what exactly this life looks like, and particularly what the connection is between our love of God and our love of neighbor. These things have to be connected. If we say we love God, but do not love our neighbors, that's suspect. And for many of us, the way that we treat our neighbors is an important part of the way we worship God. And so we're going to try to figure out how we can have human relationships, relationships with our neighbors, that fully reflect this love of God. And I think that exploring this connection, we're at an incredibly important time in church history in America to get some clarity on this connection because people are looking at the church with a microscope more than ever before. Belief in God, as you may have noticed, is no longer taken as a given, if it ever was. 
the burden is squarely on us as the church to live in such a way that people see God. And I learned this, this, this great challenge facing the church, especially in the four years I spent living and being, serving churches in Washington State, this infamously secular part of America where people do not know much about Christianity. And what they do know, they do not like. And at the church I was serving, some members and I, I'm going to share a story about a time that we faced a challenge of drawing a strong connection between our treatment of our neighbors and our love of God. A time that we, we failed to make that connection. It was in my first week or two at this church in, outside of Seattle, and a couple members of the congregation and I went, were at our local bank as my name was being added to our account. As we sat there with our banker making small talk, it of course came out that we were affiliated with the church. And our banker asked, well, should I come to your church? And of course we said, yes, yes, you should come. And he said, well, why? And before I could speak, another member of our, of our group blurted out, she said, almost instinctively, she said, well, we're just a bunch of nice people. We're a bunch of nice people. And the sentence sort of hung in the air, and it got a little awkward, and the conversation moved on to other things. But as we, after this meeting, as we drove back to the church, we reflected on this exchange, the members of the church and I, and we agreed that this response was insufficient. Sure, we'd said something about how we treat our neighbors, but we hadn't said anything about God. And of course, there are nice people everywhere. You don't need to be a Christian to be nice. And I thought to myself that we were unlikely to see our banker in worship on Sunday, or possibly ever, a prediction that sadly proved correct. And the members of the congregation and I decided that we now had our mission, that we needed to come up with something to say, something to say about our faith, about the relationship between how we treat each other and our trust in God. Perhaps some of us this morning are hungry for a similar faith, something bigger than just being nice, relationships that are bigger than just kindness, a church that's bigger than just kindness. Well, this morning, Jesus comes to us and delivers a sermon about the connection between our, love of, our treatment of neighbor and our love of God. Jesus ascends to a mountaintop and tells us what our relationships are supposed to look like, considering God's great love for us. And so we're going to go with Jesus to this mountain to hear his sermon so that we can speak with some clarity in our lives about how we treat our neighbors and how our love of neighbor reflects the full love of God in this good, rich life that Jesus wants for us. All right. Now, as we begin this discussion and start to listen to Jesus' sermon, we realize that we have to confront what we might describe as a little bit of a sense of complacency in the church. A complacency that the, the member of the congregation and I may have reflected in our response to our banker in Seattle. There's a sense out there of just the church is just a nice people, and as long as you're a good person, as long as you're sorry about the bad things you do, you know, you're, you're pretty much fine with God. And Jesus addresses this sort of complacency in his sermon. For his rhetorical strategy is to lay out a sort of baseline standard of behavior that most people might agree with, and then to raise the standard, to raise the standard. And Jesus does this by quoting from the Old Testament, from the sermon that Moses, the great lawgiver of the Ten Commandments, gave in the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. Moses gave his great sermon from another mountain, Mount Sinai. And I want to be clear that as Jesus quotes these Old Testament passages, he's by no means criticizing them. He's not criticizing Moses or saying that the law is not good. I mean, goodness, we just had our children singing the beautiful psalm. Jesus is not saying anything to take away from the psalm or the law or from Moses. 
but he seems to want us to, to get to the core root, to look at where the law might be pointing us. The deep, reconciled relationships to which God calls us to. So Jesus talks about the law's references to a couple of relationships, our marriages, relationships in the church. And he says, you've heard it was said this, but I say, you've heard it was said, for example, don't murder, but I'm going to say something more. What Jesus seems to be saying is, civility is good, kindness is good, but I want more for you. I want more than mere toleration. I wonder whether our church and our community have sometimes fallen into this sense of complacency, a toleration or a distance that keeps us from true community and true relationship with God and neighbor. Certainly, perhaps our country has fallen into this sense of distance or mere toleration. I recently came across a poll, at least, that suggested this. It was a poll looking at how American relationships have changed as a result of the 2016 presidential election. It asked people to think about their close friends and their family members. And this poll found that as a direct result of the 2016 election, 16% of us have stopped talking to someone who was previously a close friend or family member. And 13% of us have taken the formal step of ending a relationship with someone who previously was a close friend or family member. We have not killed them or murdered them, but we have essentially said, 13% of us have said, you are dead to me. I want nothing more to do with you. The church, of course, has been complicit, I think, in this division and separation. But I wonder, even if our churches, if we've resigned ourselves to this distance or toleration, a, a way of being Christian that is pretty isolated. We say, I have my clique, the people I know who look like me and think like me, and that's enough. If someone different from me comes in, it's not my responsibility to get to know them or greet them or understand them. And if we take this attitude we have, I suppose, technically fulfilled the law. We've met the letter, but perhaps not the spirit. And if this is how we've organized our communities and our church, a community of mere toleration, people may question our faith, our love of God. If all we do is tolerate one another, perhaps the God we believe in, they might say, merely tolerates us. But Jesus comes to us this morning with his sermon because he wants us to experience a bigger life, a deeper and richer love with God and with our neighbors that's far beyond toleration, far beyond mere survival. Jesus wants us to raise our standards of love to match the extravagant, reconciling, all-encompassing love of God. And so instead of talking about murder, Jesus wants us to think about anger. Anger, this universal root core sin at the cause of murder and so much of our problems. And so let's listen as Jesus raises the stakes. You've heard it was said you shouldn't murder. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. If you call someone a fool, you're liable to the hell of fire. If you insult a brother or sister, you're liable to the church council. Noticing we've got a few church council members here, Bud and uh, Celeste. Perhaps you were unaware that included in your duties are to keep a running tally of the insults and, uh, and, and to, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, Bud. Uh, the insults and turmoil in each marriage and relationship in this church. And as I check my calendar, I see we're meeting Tuesday night, so I'll expect a full report. But instead, Jesus gives us a solution. He says, before you even come to church and give your offering, 
Leave your gift there at the, before the altar and first go and be reconciled to your brother. Then, after you're reconciled, then come and offer your gift. This sounds crazy to us. We wonder, how could we, do, how could we practice this in our lives? Well, this reconciliation seems to be God's mission on earth. And it is precisely what Jesus has come to do, to bring people who were far off, who seemed hopelessly divided from one another, hopelessly divided from God, together. For there was a time when God seemed to be standing far off. God was watching us from heaven, watching us clumsily attempt to follow God's laws. We had this law, we had some sign of God's presence, but we weren't loving God perfectly, and we weren't loving our neighbor as ourselves. Lord knows we tried, and yet God did not stop speaking to any of us, let alone 16% of us. And God did not end the relationship with any of us, let alone with 13% of us. Instead, God came down from heaven in the person of Jesus to restore relationship with all of creation. God becoming human in Jesus is God's way of saying to us that anger and separation can be dealt with through God's love. And even as Jesus was hated and killed, even as he received the full anger of the world on the cross, he reached his arms out so that we would know that love is possible. God raised Jesus from the dead so that we would know that anger, even anger leading to murder, does not win. There is always a path back to reconciliation to community through Christ's love. This morning, after hearing Jesus' sermon on the mountain, I hope we realize that we are the people, the only people who can carry this message on to the world. In our church, in our community, that we have something to say when people ask us about our faith. If someone asks us why we are a Christian or why they should bother with the church, we can say, because Jesus has constantly pursued me and loved me. I can love God back and worship God. And only then, after a lot of talk about what God has done for us, can we talk about how we treat our neighbors. And we'll use adjectives a lot stronger than nice. We'll say, because God didn't kill us, even when we might have deserved it, we don't kill others who we think might deserve it. Because God has been faithful to me, Even when I was disobedient, we are faithful to others. Because God has treated us with kindness and patience, we treat others with kindness and patience. To be such a people requires honesty and humility. It requires leaning into conflict, and it requires courage. But Jesus has shown us with his life, death, and resurrection what that courage looks like. And in his sermon, he's commanded us to love God and neighbor. Let's be that community for each other and for our world. In Jesus' name, amen.